right. You probably are wondering where you should turn. Uh, Psalm 42. So go ahead and open to Psalm 42. That way, that way you're there and you don't have to flip later. I will not have it on the screen. I intentionally didn't put it on the screen um, because I was hoping you would all have a physical Bible. Uh, if you have to use your phone, it's fine. But, so, all right, thumbs up if you guys are at Psalm 42. Thumbs up if you're at Psalm 42. Okay, hopefully you guys are almost there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started now that we have the Bible situation figured out. Cool? Great. Um, do you guys know who C.S. Lewis is? Yes. 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 There's a resounding yes from this direction. Uh, A lot of you will know him from writing The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, but he also wrote a lot of other books. One of them is called The Problem of Pain, and I'm going to read a quote that's already on the screen, because, yep. He says in his book, mental pain is less dramatic than physical pain, but it is more common and also more hard to bear. The frequent attempt to conceal mental pain increases the burden. Is it, it is easier to say, my tooth is aching, than to say, my heart is broken. So C.S. Lewis wrote these words in 1940, but today, over 80 years later, mental pain is still a burden that a lot of people carry. Um, and broken hearts are still difficult to talk about because it's not something physical that we can see. Um, I bet a lot of you already know this statistic. It's a very vague statistic, but it's still a statistic that most teenagers in our world today struggle with some sort of depression, anxiety, worry, some sort of mental health. That majority of you in the room, if we have 130 students in here right now, over probably 75% of you or more have struggled with mental health at some point or are currently doing that. And a lot of people are afraid to actually talk about these issues. Um, One of the things I love about your generation is that you will talk about them. You will post on social media about mental health. You will talk about going to see a therapist and it's very encouraging to hear that Um, But sadly, even in churches, a lot of people won't talk about mental health because it's kind of this taboo topic. Um, But Bentry and us here at HSM, we want to be a place where we can talk about those things with openness and honesty while still partnering with having a faith in the Lord and that he is our ultimate healer. So the Bible also isn't afraid to talk about Uh, mental health. Um, Some of you might be a little surprised by that. Um, We don't see it right away because they don't always use the same language that we use now. Um, So like the book of Ecclesiastes says, it doesn't say, excuse me, that Solomon was depressed, but he does say multiple times, everything is meaningless. So you can sort of connect the dots on that one. Um, The Bible doesn't say in 1 Kings, Elijah was suicidal, but it does tell us that in a moment of fatigue and fear, he asked God to take his life. The Psalms doesn't outright say that David could have benefited from professional counseling, but when you see in Psalms his blood, sweat, and tears spill out over his poetry, I think you can rightly make that claim that he needed help. The fact is the Bible is filled with people who went through very similar struggles, and that's because God understands our struggles. He understands all of the things that we struggle with and even has tools in his word to help those of us who are struggling. And I also, I want to be very clear. I want to be very clear in this statement so that no one walks out of here confused that sometimes in our lives, we need something more than pray about it. Sometimes there are seasons in our lives where we need professional counseling, where we might need medication to help with something that's going on in us. 
So I just want to be clear that there are seasons where that is, might happen, and that is where you connect with the adults in your life and with your parents and those grown-ups, and you make those decisions together. So I just want to be very clear that I am not just saying, pray about it and your mental health problems will go away. That is not at all what I am saying. But we are going to sit in a lot tonight of sitting in Scripture and what does the Bible have to say and how does taking things to the Lord, how does that help us? Um, so we are still going to lean on God. And so tonight we're actually starting a series, a two week series, um, that is going to talk about fear and worry and depression and anxiety. Uh, and it's titled, Oh, my soul out of Psalm 42. So although we could use any of those examples that I talked about earlier to study for this series, we're really going to look to David for help particularly his words in Psalm 42. Now, there are some scholars who don't 1,000% agree that David actually wrote this psalm. Um, You know, wild to think that some people might disagree on something. Uh, Just kidding. Um, So they, they might say that there were some other groups of people who could have written this psalm, Uh, But I tend to fall in the camp that this psalm is penned a lot like Psalm 63, which we know that David wrote. And so I, the strain of it is a lot of the same terminology, how it flows. um, And therefore, scholars presume that David is who wrote it. Um, So we're going to move forward with tonight and next week saying that David is who wrote Psalm 42. But I would encourage you to study it. I would encourage you to ask questions, and maybe you'll sit in a camp of, no, I don't think David actually wrote this, and that's okay. That's okay. So, um, so I want to tell you guys a little bit about David, because maybe some of you have no idea who he is, but I would assume a lot of you do. Um, David was the youngest of eight brothers. Uh, he was a shepherd. Then he became a giant killer, i.e. Goliath, uh, and then he became a king. So, like, wild resume that this man has. Uh, He was both tough and tender, uh, and then he knew how to fight and how to feel. Um, Sorry, guys, just having some little, like, tape problems. (laughs) Michael, can I just have a handheld? Okay. (laughs) We'll we'll figure out what just happened with that tape and my hair and all of the things. Girls, you guys understand. There's just a lot of hair. Um, So... Uh, What I was saying about David, he was tough and he was tender. Uh, He knew how to fight, but he also knew how to feel and like to sit in his emotions. And he also knew when to weep. In fact, David was quite the weeper, according to his Psalms. Um, Is there anybody else out there who would like declare that like you are a crier? Hey, it's okay. It's okay. We're going we're gonna to do a, a little baby activity. Thank you for being honest. Um, I will say, as I have gotten older, I have become a crier. Not like intense, like don't like, but anyway. Uh, so I'm going to go through it. We're just going to do a fun little activity. There's four different types of criers out there. I just kind of made up four different criers. Uh, and then you're going to raise your hand on if you think you're that one. Okay? So super easy. Uh, There's the beaver dam crier. I know, these names, genius. It's called the beaver dam crier. This crier does everything he or she can do to hold back the flow of tears. They'll do anything in their power to just stop them from a, stop a single tear from falling. Anybody, anybody, like you won't let anybody see you cry. Like, Not even your dog has seen you cry, probably. Okay, okay, cool, cool. Uh, Then there's um, then there's the hiccup crier, the hiccup. This crier is trademarked by just like crying and like noises coming out, like it it there could be snorts in the tears, just like all sorts of like hiccups and various just like. I don't even know how to impersonate it. Anybody, anybody want to claim? Yeah, yeah, you guys look like that. Sam, hiccupper. Okay, okay. And now you could also fall into a couple different categories, which is also okay. Um, then you guys are going to, I don't know if you'll like this one or not. Uh, there's the broken AC crier. 
Uh, this person employs physical movement to just like help them release their emotions. So like expect like rapidly flailing their arms as if they're about to pass out from the heat. So like there's just like the, <sighs> anybody, anybody wanna like that? No, okay, okay, I mean, it's fine, it's fine. Okay, and then I think this is actually a lot of you, this last one, but I don't know how many of us like to admit it. There's just the ugly crier. I am hand down, like, I, I am hands down an ugly crier. Uh, like when I'm like weeping, like crying. Um, I watch, this is off topic, but I watch a lot of like reality TV show competition shows, so like Big Brother, and I judge real hard ugly criers. Like I judge them and then I'm over here like, <laughs> yeah, so anyway. So <laughs> all of that said, all of that said, no matter how you cry, or when you cry, or your frequency of crying, you are in good company with King David as a crier. Yeah, that was a good, that was a pretty smooth transition, right? Okay, so now I'm going to pray. Now that we've had a little, like, laughing and fun, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to, like, dig into Psalm 42. Okay, so pray with me. God, we come to you right now, and we, we just thank you for this time together. We thank you for giving us a space where we can laugh and cry and just be in your word together. Um, Lord, I love you, and I just pray that you speak through me um, as your vessel and just speak to these students and leaders about what you have to say about Psalm 42. Lord, we love you, and I pray all in your name. Amen. Okay, so we're going to check out the first three verses of Psalm 42. We all there, right? Okay, so I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. So they say, As a deer longs for flowing streams, so I long for you, God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while all day long people say to me, Where is your God? So David here is giving us a glimpse at the state of his life, and a state of his soul right now. Um, and it's pretty obvious he is in a bad, a bad spot. Such a bad way that like he says like he can't even eat. I don't understand people who forget to eat or like who go, oh, I'm such in a space that like I can't eat. I am the opposite. If I am upset, you better bring me cupcakes. Uh, so like he's saying like, I am in such a down spot that like, I cannot eat. Uh, and like, because David is a poet, he's obviously going to say it very eloquently and he's going to describe, he's not going to describe his pain in like a bland or a vanilla way. He's going to go, Oh, my tears, my tears have been my food day and night. Like I'm going Give me the cupcakes. That's what I would say. So in essence, he's also saying that my menu, my menu for days for breakfast, lunch, and dinner has been my tears. And like, tears are gross. They're salty. And like, they're not good. They taste like your skin. Look, I've done some weeping in my life. So I don't, now I don't know if he like literally meant that the tears are rolling down his face, down his cheek, and like into his mouth. Like, I don't know if that's what he means, or if it's just like this, again, poetic language that he's so distraught that like he can't eat. But like, you get the point. Like, he is struggling, and he's explaining his pain in the best way he can. So he's also, we know from context, from, from scholars who are much smarter than me, uh, we know from context that in this time when this, this psalm is written, um, that David's enemies are taunting him and that he has lost everything. Um, but David, he knows where God is and where to find him. Because David didn't immediately, because, excuse me, because God didn't immediately appear for David's deliverance, his enemies concluded that God had abandoned David. Like, so they assumed, oh, well, your God's not here. He's not saving you. Um, and so, but we know, and David knew, that no, no, God was still there 
with him even in this season. His enemies are asking him, hey, where's your protector? He's not protecting you anymore. Like, you're so sad. Like, you've been left alone. But all David can do is continue to weep. There's a phrase out there, and I know it's not super common, so maybe it's like a weird southern east coast thing. I don't know. uh, That talks about talking to your tears. Um, Sometimes, like I know it sounds a little weird, but I, I think that's what's happening to David. Like I think he's hearing his tears also asking him. It's also the idea of like hearing your emotions and like acknowledging that your emotions are talking to you. And like he's, they're asking him, where's your God? So like it, it kind of is like connected to your soul and all of the things that are connected to you. And so not only are his enemies asking him, hey, where, where is your God? But his soul and his emotions and his tears are also going, hey, where's, where's our God? So if you stop and think about this for a moment, David's enemies are taunting him and going, hey, where's God in all of this? Surely you wouldn't be crying if God was present or real. Like, surely you would have your life together. Your tears that are present on your face is proof that your God has abandoned you. That's what his enemies are telling him. And that's what his emotions and his tears are also telling him. That, hey, you've been abandoned. And in this depressed state, David is, is maybe starting to believe it. The things that David is feeling and processing, the idea of like, hey, God, where, where are you? What's happening? Are, are things that I have felt and processed as well. And there have been times where, where I let my tears and my emotions and my, my soul talk to me as if they were my enemies, going, hey, your God has left you. This wouldn't happen to you if your God was still present. And I begin to think, yeah, yeah, my, my emotions are probably right. Where is God in all of this? And it's okay if that's happening. It's okay if you're, you're asking that question and you're wrestling with that. You don't have to put on a perfect Christian mask and you don't have to shove all of those emotions down and go, yeah, my life stinks right now, but man, yeah, like I understand that sometimes we do have that and we fully believe that, but what I'm trying to affirm to you is that there might be seasons in your life where you are going, God, where are you? What is happening? Why would you let this happen? And so for me, the year of 2020 was that. And really from 2020 through probably the last few months was a lot of me questioning where was God. I knew he was here. I knew he existed. I knew that he had a plan for my life. But as you guys remember, 2020 was not easy on anybody. Everyone was experiencing the pandemic. For me, it all started out fine. It was only supposed to be two weeks, if you guys remember that. You were just supposed to have an added spring break like an added week, and we were all like, yeah, an added spring break week. It's going to be the best week of our lives. And then the days turned into weeks, and the weeks turned into months. Now, I was enjoying some new hobbies. I started baking. I now have a business because of it. So, like, there are positive things. I was getting to spend a lot of time with my husband. We were newlyweds. So, like, we were getting to spend time that we never would have gotten to spend together. I was FaceTiming my family a lot because we were all in our little separate places. But then again, the weeks of the lockdown turned into months, and we didn't, we didn't see an end at all. Um, that summer, I started feeling very overwhelmed. I was very fearful. I became a little worry wart. Um, I was worried about all the things at all the time, like all at the same time. Um, And I was questioning everything. Not like I was questioning like, were our finances okay? Was I going to have a job? Like my husband's job, was he going to be okay? Because he does events and like they weren't happening. Uh, I work for a church. People don't have money. So how do I get paid? Like I was questioning all the things all the time. 
I was also questioning the safety of my family because they didn't live here. I had a sister at the time living in Asia, which is where it all started. So <laughs> uh, she is here. She's fine. She's alive. Uh, and then I, I started questioning and I let my emotions take control. And I started questioning where was God in all of this? But I didn't think I could voice that out loud because it would make me, one, a bad Christian, and two, a bad church staff member. So, like, how can I voice that I don't know where God is in all of this because I'm not seeing the fruit? But other Christians, of course, social media is telling complete truth all the time, were having the times of their lives. And I was like, okay, what am I missing? They're having like worship live streams. They're studying the Bible all the time. They're having Zoom prayer circles. I wouldn't let myself admit that I was angry and I was frustrated. And so I kept it, I just kept shoving it all down. Now, I would, obviously, I would talk to Harrison about it. So, like, there was one person I was talking to, but he didn't get it because he was going to work by himself to work in a warehouse and do nothing but play video games all day. And, like, that was his dream. So, like, he got it, but he didn't get it. And so I was talking to him, but I was just shoving it all down. So I just listed a lot of emotions, which I was not dealing with in a healthy way, um, I joked earlier that I am an emotional eater. Um, Harrison and I gained a lot of weight during the pandemic because I was eating my emotions instead of dealing with them. Um, All of those emotions started evolving into anxiety and fear, which after a time would come out physically for me into anxiety attacks. Now, this is not the first time that I have had, that I have dealt with anxiety or had anxiety attacks. I had them in college quite a bit um, because it was a new season for me. Um, I had them as a young adult, but it wouldn't, they, I eventually, like I would always get help. So I don't know why I didn't get help this time because I should have looked back and gone, well, this was helpful Um, because I thought I could handle it. And I thought, oh, I'm in my 30s. I'm a grown-up now. I can handle it. During those anxiety attacks, specifically in the summer of 2020, I was unconsolable. Like, when you think of, like, the movies where, like, someone is, like, emotionally distraught and, like, no one can comfort them, that was the state that I was in. I was angry, I was frustrated, all the emotions and all the things, but not only at God, but also at my own self for letting myself get there. So it was like this whole weird circle of of questioning God and questioning myself and questioning all the things, but knowing God was still there. I never stopped believing in God. I knew that he had a plan and that we would come out the other end and that he was faithful. But I also would just kind of sit. And I remember my first anxiety attack that Harrison ever saw. And if you um, have anxiety attacks or panic attacks, you know the first time that you let someone see one, it's scary for them. Um, The short version of that story is I was stressing about finances, whether we were gonna lose our apartment because we were barely making ends meet. I was working three jobs, like all of the things. And I just was having one of those days. And Harrison said, hey, let's go get ice cream. Because, you know, we got to feed our emotions with ice cream. And I said, well, we can't. We don't don't have money. Like we, like barely were making ends meet. Like we couldn't go on dates anymore. And he's like, no, no, let's, we'll just go to Sonic. It's going to cost no more than $7. Like, It'll be fine. I said, okay. But the whole time, like Sonic was like right across the street from our apartment. The whole time, I just start, I start spiraling. I start thinking of all the things. We get the ice cream. We're sitting in the car, and I just, the ice cream hits my hand, that little Sonic blast with extra Reese's cups. I shouldn't have gotten the extra Reese's cups. (laughs) Hits my hand, and I just lose it. And he 
just looks at me. And he goes, do we need to go home? And all I could do was nod. So we get home. He gets me to a place that I am safe and that I feel comfortable. And I remember he didn't say a lot of words. I didn't either because I'm like weeping. And I like, when I also have anxiety attacks, I tend to kind of curl up into like a ball, like in the fetal position. So like he also has a really small car. So like I remember I couldn't get to my safe position until we got home. Um, but we didn't talk a lot. And I also remember that he would try different things to like help calm me because he's my person. He's my safe place. And so he's feeling like if he can't help me, then like, like what's, I, like we've had a lot of talks since then, but like he just felt like he had to do something. And so he would do different things like put the covers over me. And like I would either react one of two ways. I would either like start calming down because I was like, that was a good thing, but I still wasn't using words because I was very unconsolable. Or I would just get louder because I didn't like whatever he did. So I remember I didn't like the covers because it just, it just was hot. <laughs> when you have an anxiety attack, it just gets really hot. <laughs> and so like he would rip them away and then he would like try something else. And then like we would go back and forth between these things and it was just a very servant hearted season and night for him. And then I remember the thing that got me to calm down the most is that he got out a playlist that I have on Spotify that's just worship songs that I love. And I started it when I was probably 25 years old. So it's got 12 years worth of worship songs that take me back to different seasons of life. And he just started playing it very quietly in our bedroom. And he said that within seconds, my body started to like calm and like he could visibly see all of that happening for me. And like, I don't really, like I remember it, but don't like remember it. I got to a place where I was, I say done, but like I could talk again. And so I explained to him what had happened and he listened and then he shared his side of the story and what happened from his point of view. And we got to a place and after that night, we got to a place where I now have to be much more vocal with him on when I feel these things coming because he can help me from crossing over into an attack like that night at Sonic. Now, I'm not saying that my life is perfect by now. Uh, I even had a little baby anxiety attack at the fall retreat last year, but none of you knew. Um, and I'm not saying that of like, I'm a great hider, but I, I knew what I had to do and I found my person and he took me aside. He also let me take a nap that afternoon. For you guys, it was because we didn't have air conditioning and I didn't sleep. So like, there are also clues that he goes, oh, she didn't sleep. She hasn't had a real meal in 24 hours. She gonna, she gonna need a nap. So he made it happen. So like, I tell you this story because I have a person, I have people, multiple people in my life where I can go, hey, this is what I'm feeling. I don't know how far I am down the line, but I'm, I'm starting to listen to my emotions with them telling me that God isn't real or that questioning as to why God is letting this happen. I also, um, there is a song, a lot of you probably heard it this year at Pine Cove, um, called Undivided Heart. Um, it's a watermark song. It actually came out a couple years ago. Um, and there are some lyrics in it that are very parallel to scripture. It talks about having a heart that is prone to wander and to worry, uh, which is very much where my heart is when I am in an anxious state. Um, but knowing that fearing God alone is the ultimate desire. That is what these lyrics are about. Um, and so that is also something I do. There's a couple songs, there's passages of scripture that I will do and go and read and listen to. And I start praying or I start talking to my professional. Um, and I really, I still have issues, but I, I tell you again, all of that story to know, hey, you're not alone. You're not alone in this. And it also looks very different. Harrison would say that he probably has anxiety as well, but 
it looks very different in him because he is very different than me. And we are, God built us very differently. Um, so I did a lot of why asking during the pandemic, specifically to God. And that was okay. And I look back on that season and those couple of years and go, I am a very different person. I believe in God very differently and in a much better way by differently is what I mean. Um, I have a much stronger faith because of that season. And I'm, I don't want to say I'm grateful for it, but I am grateful for it. Um, and it also allowed my husband and I to like understand each other better, um, which probably would have taken us 10 years to get to that point, maybe, um, if it hadn't been for the pandemic. Now, you might be sitting there going, cool, Maria, that was a really long story that you said was going to be short. I know, I know. Um, But I don't have those problems. And I'm going to say, hey, that's totally fine. But there is also, but there's still something that you can take out of this sermon, and that is how to support your people. So if you have a friend who is walking through anxiety, depression, worry, like Harrison, here's something that you can do. You can cry with them. And then also point them to Jesus. Sit with them. Cry with them. The Bible encourages us to weep with those who weep and cry with our friends. And when the time is right, to gently help them see the truth that God is still here. Now, if you rush the process, you're going to look like Job's friends. So we don't want to do that. What? Oh, oh, I thought someone was like, who? Uh, Which is not a great thing. So cry with them, be with them, and remind them of the truth of God. That was a long time for the first three verses. My apologies. Uh, So now we're going to move to verse 4. Okay. Okay. Uh, verse four, hopefully you still have your Bibles open. Huh? Huh? Still? Cool. Great. Uh, verse four says, I remember this as I pour out my heart, how I walked with many leading the festive procession to the house of God with joyful and thankful shouts. Now we don't know for sure, but David probably wrote this either while one of two things (laughs) fleeing from his evil predecessor, Saul, or while fleeing from his own son who rebelled against him. Both are awful options. Uh, Naturally, but like naturally he's pouring out his soul and weeping at the thought of better times. Whatever the like actual condition is, he's going, oh, there were such better times. He's thinking about how he used to lead his people to the house of God, how they sang and danced and worshiped and all these amazing memories that he has. And now he's here fleeing for his life from people that maybe one person he loved and someone else. Like he's fleeing for his life. So hopefully none of us ever have to run from our kinfolk and flee for our lives. But pain is still pain. And when you're in this place, overwhelmed by nostalgia of better times, of, oh, back in the day, it was so good, you have to, you still have to be careful a little bit because those memories can either be a source of hope, which is what we would want them to be. We would want them to be a source of hope, or they could potentially be a source of hurt and take you down a path that is not healthy. Memories can bring hope because when you think about what used to be, you look forward to what could be again. Um, But memories can also be a source of hurt where you, like David in verse 4, are crushed by them and ravaged by the fear that you may never experience that joy again. Which is why sometimes you need to remind, we're going to say you must talk back to your tears, since we're talking to our tears. Sometimes you have to talk back to your tears and tell yourself, hey, self, it's going to be okay. Because the hope that I have is great for the future. So, and then in verse 5, 
It says, why, my soul, are you so dejected? Why are you in such turmoil? Put your hope in God, for I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. Here is where we see the bulk of David's processing. He says, some of your translations might have said something a little different than mine. I'm coming out of a CSB. But some of your verses, your translations might say, why are you cast down? Oh, my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? I would say that most cases of depression and anxiety come with questions, specifically questions that end or start with why. Why? Why this? Why that? Why is this happening? For some of you who are wrestling with this, your questions in self-dialogue may sound like, why am I feeling this way? Life is good. Circumstances are fine. What's wrong with me? Why is this going on? Or for others, you might know why you're feeling anxious or worry or fearful, and you go, I know why I'm hurting, but I don't know why it's hitting so hard. Or maybe you do know why it's hitting so hard, or why is this happening to me? But in this psalm, I would guess that David is dealing kind of with a combination of the two. A combination of he knows why it's happening, but doesn't maybe know why it's hurting, but at the same time, why is this happening? Um, All those things. But it's also helpful to see someone who's gone before us practicing talking back to himself and like questioning of like, hey, it's going to be okay. In this case, he focuses on a couple things. He says, put your hope in God, for I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. So there's that word hope again. Hope. It plays a very critical role in the thick of fear and worry, depression, anxiety. Hope is really sometimes the only thing that a person who is in one of those seasons has. And it's such a simple word, but also such a complicated word. So in this verse, it uh, shines some helpful light on what specifically David puts his hope in. If you dig into the verse, you'll see David calling you to remind yourself of God's deliverance and delight. You're going, where are those words? I don't see them. I'll show you. Uh, This is where David and our hope lies. David's soul is weary, and he's he's in such despair, but he resists and says, hey, no, I'm not going to give up because I will praise God again. Those joyful memories can come and be present again. David refuses to give in to despair. He puts his hope in God's deliverance. He puts his hope in the truth that God will not abandon him and leave him, that God is with him right now. He's putting all of his hope in God, not in himself, and not in the people around him, but he's putting his hope in God. In verse 5, where it says, my, some of your translations will say, my salvation and my God, or my Savior and my God. They kind of go back and forth. Um, in other translations, uh, like the KJV, for example, which I would be shocked if any of you have that, uh, it's going to say, hope thou in God. For I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Does anybody know what the word countenance means? Tell me. (laughs) Okay. Okay. So to lift your countenance on someone was to show them favor, to show them delight. So this applies to God in this verse. So if you, so like God is showing favor on him and it does, he does the same for all of us. In number six, 24 to 27, again, I think it's on the screen. I think I made a slide for this one because I didn't want you guys to have to flip. I felt bad for you. So I don't want to make flip to numbers. Um, it says, may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. In this way, they will pronounce my name over the Israelites, and I will bless them. God is telling his people that his face towards them and his view of them is not one of disgust or anger, but of grace and of peace. In other words, God smiles at his people, 
and is proud of his people when they're following his will. So David would have known this blessing. Like he would have probably had this blessing memorized and probably had to repeat it over and over again. He knew the book of Numbers. So I don't know for sure, but I would guess that it was a joy to David's soul to know this passage and that it might have been something that he recited over and over again because the terminology is very similar from the psalm to this Numbers passage. Um, If we remind ourselves that God is a deliverer who delights in us, we will make it through the storm. Storms aren't easy. Storms aren't always fast. But we know that we will make it through because God promises to deliver us. With that said, we're going to look at verse 6, and this is the last verse we're going to look at for tonight of Psalm 42. In the CSB, it says, I am deeply depressed. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and the peaks of Hermon from Mount Mazar. David acknowledges his pain once more and says, I am, I am like so saddened. In some of your versions, it might say, my soul is cast down. But then it gets very practical, and he gives a tip. He says a very simple and a very powerful phrase. I remember you. He was now driven to the utmost borders of the land of Canaan. Remember, he's like fleeing. We talked about that earlier. He's fleeing. So he's like having to go to this far border. And then he's having to shelter. But then someone's going to find him. And then he's having to run somewhere else. So he's talking about all these places that he has had to go and hide. But still, in all of that, he is remembering God. While his focus has adjusted from being very sad and downtrodden, in verse 4, he is remembering better times, which leaves him bitter But then he comes back and goes, wait, 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 but I do know that God is with me. In all of these places, David remembered God and lifted up his heart to him, and he kept continuing continuing to follow God. And we see that again in in Psalm 105, um, 105 verses 4 to 6 says, seek the Lord and his strength, seek his face always, remember the wondrous works he has done his wonders and the judgments he has pronounced, you offspring of Abraham, his servant, Jacob's descendants, his chosen ones. In other words, he's saying, hey, look at God's fingerprints. Look at your past and go, hey, you can see where God is faithful. You can see remembering who God was. So the last point, uh, if you're in a season of depression, anxiety, worry, fear, Trace God's fingerprints for signs of his past faithfulness so that you can have confidence for his future faithfulness. I say try to remember because sometimes it's really hard. Sometimes, sometimes I want to hit my husband and go, please stop remembering me, reminding me of God's faithfulness because I just want to sit and be sad. But then I go, no, that's not very nice. You're doing what I asked you to do in our little family meeting a couple weeks ago. So thank you for reminding me of God's faithfulness. Seriously. So if you're sitting here going, okay, I wonder if there's anything else I can do to help support my friends. Be available to process with them. You're not going to have, like, family meetings like Harrison and I have. That would be weird. You'd have small group meetings. Hey, how are we doing? Um, So tonight, we talked about the first half of Psalm 42. We got a very intimate look at David processing his pain. He is wrecked by his circumstances, and as a result, his enemies interrogate him about God's presence and his faithfulness or lack thereof. However, David pushes back and assures his tears of God's present delight in him and pending deliverance. So he assures them that I will be delivered, assures himself that he will be delivered by God. Building off this spark of hope, we see that he proceeds to kind of go along with his memory, with thoughts, and just reminding himself of God's faithfulness. 
So we're about to head into small group time. And what I would love as small group, in small group time, I would love for you guys to read these six verses again, and maybe a few times, and just really sit in them and really ponder what stands out to you, what hits home, and really just how do these, how does the first half of Psalm 42 connect to where you are in your life right now in the season that you're in? So I am going to pray for us, um, and then you will be dismissed to small group time. If you are new, uh, welcome. What a first night to come. Uh, If you're new and you don't know where to go, uh, Kevin is in the back. I am up here. We would be happy to connect you to a small group. So uh, let's pray. Remember I said I was going to pray. Okay. God, we come to you right now, and we are so thankful for you and thankful for scripture like Psalm 42 that can point us in your direction. God, I pray in small group time we can have open and honest conversation about where we are and what season we're in. Lord, just be with us and guide us. We love you. And I pray all in your name. Amen. Amen.